Good morning. Today is our last day. I was very happy to be here, honestly. Never been in South America, in Brazil, in this amazing city. We still have, I still have a couple of weeks around, so if you want to show me around, just call me, okay, and we can, we can hang out. Today we are here for the last lecture on this course on, on dark matter and scalar fields dark matter and how, we, how historically this, this subject grows and how I came out working with ultralight fields. Why? I hope that the why was, was clear. Uh, these, were, th these are all the lectures, so uh, tonight, uh, tonight, today, you're going to see them all. Now I'm going to, of course, keep to the new part, but as a matter of principle, they, they are here. The group has them here, so if you want to look at them. I also have some notes. I basically took my PhD thesis and I shrink it, so I have notes. If you want to look at the calculation, ask me. Okay, they are not in the best shape, but they are good to, to accompany all this with more referencing. I will give you some referencing at the end, but the subject is vast, so I couldn't name them all here. Yeah, so I think now it's kind of clear why we are here, because we can use fundamental fields to describe dark matter, and today I'm going to put some compact objects and see the effect on gravitational waves. So that's why, more or less, we were here during this lecture. This was the nice roof of the church in Rome. So this was the historical part. Uh, we arrived to motivate why some of the open problems in cosmology are, are uh, answered, uh, are partially answered by cold dark matter candidates. This was the history of cold dark matter candidates, some of the, these examples, baryonic and norbaryonic, and then we arrived to the um, open challenges and the ultralight scalar field. This was the picture that uh, probably <laughs> Caio wanted, but it's not from me, it's from Alice Quill, and I put the credit. And basically, uh, this was the, uh, the outline that I showed you last time of, with a question that we want to answer. We, we are partially answering to the first part, so static perturbation. So we are placing a black hole inside a dark matter halo, or at least a core of a dark matter halo that is described by scalar fields. And now we try to understand what is happening. The theory, we saw, we saw it so many times during these days, it's just GR with a massive complex scalar field with a mass parameter mu. And we are going to solve basically this equation. So I have to, to thank you for all the interesting questions. Uh, in fact, one of Nuno last time, uh, I think it's going to be around here, I, I had this mistake in which the energy was equal to the number of particle times the, the mass of each particle. That's at the leading order. So now I replace the equal with the similar. Uh, this explains why also these objects have, have only normal modes, so why things are not just destroyed by adding a tiny amount of mass. Thank you, Nuno. Yeah, this DC here. This property of having that the Schrodinger Poisson system scales with a quantity that I'm calling lambda, so you can find one object and then you find them all. It's important even at the perturbative level because you can find even in the perturbative equation a scale invariant quantity lambda in which you can just solve for one object and find them all. That's very useful. And we arrive to settle what's the problem. So we are perturbing a background psi knot with the generic perturbation. Even if this, this background is spherically symmetric, the perturbation is generic. You find your nice system of equation, and to today what we are going to do is play some p here and see what happens. Just as a recap, the equation for the perturbation that can be used even in other contexts can, can, can be written in this matricial way here. When you put that p is zero, you can find the quasi-normal modes by imposing boundary condition and finding the only frequencies that that um, uh, give you regularity at the origin and the outgoing wave at infinity, so you can do a matching procedure. We don't do a matching procedure. We look at the, the, uh, the, the points where the derivatives of the fundamental matrix of the system, where each of these vectors is a boundary condition, like uh, 
uh, uh, regularity the origin 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The second one will have zero boundary condition, regularity the origin 0, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. So you build your, your matrix, you, 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 you see which, you, for which frequency the determinant is zero, and you find your quasi normal modes that are summarized in the table of, of, of last day. Instead, when you solve perturbative problems with uh, a matter source, instead of having that your homogeneous equation, so equals zero, you will have a source. To solve it, variation of parameter, you impose your boundary condition, and you will use the solution of the homogeneous problem that enters in this uh, fundamental matrix, F. You use them to weight, basically, the integral of the Fourier transform of your matter field that you impose. So in this way, you find the energy, so you find, sorry, the perturbative function Z1, Z2, and U, their value at infinity, because what you want to look, when you want to measure radiation emitted, when you want to measure quantities, observables, you put yourself at infinity, far away, and then you ask, okay, what's the perturbative result here? I'm putting a particle, I'm integrating, so you have your dynamics, and you extract the value Z at infinity. These values enter, will enter in your uh, energy emitted and all the quantities that you might be interested in. This was just the limitation of our problem. And here is what I'm meaning with the, the observable. So the, the observable that you might need. So you look at, for instance, the energy, the quantity of energy emitted per unit of time, and it will be an integrated quantity over all the possible frequency that your object excites when it moves inside your medium of your Z1 at infinite and Z2 at infinite. So this quantity that you are solving with for very far away. Now what we do, what we did is show first the, the modes, second, these were the modes. This was the problem of putting a black hole in the center of a galaxy, because if the galaxy is embedded in a dark matter halo, eventually this black hole could be the responsible of the spikes that we see in numerical simulation. So even if numeric and body simulation of WIMPs shows you that dark matter profile grows at the center and you cannot really explain it without uh, further adding something else, well, it could have been that a black hole could have explained actually why this, this is happening, but as we show here, it's not, because when you place a black hole and you solve your static perturbation, you will find that the, 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 the perturbation that you are adding because of the particle, yeah, these black holes are all particles because we are looking at a system whose typical size is way larger than the size of the perturber, when you put this particle at the center, the dark matter halo doesn't increase that much in perturbation, so it's not asking to the scalar field to get too much high in the center. And this is in contrast with what we know about dark matter particles of big masses. And we arrived here, in here. So we are gonna now feed the black hole with scalar particles. And this is a very complicated problem. It requires numerical simulation. And right now, there are groups in the UK, in the US, in Portugal, that are working on this. So my, um, I'm not claiming that we solved the problem. We cracked and we have a perfect analytical solution for this problem because there is not. But since numerical solutions requires time, they, they give you accuracy, but it requires also a lot of time. So it's, it might be good to have some kind of analytical grasp of what is happening, so people then can benchmark. But that, that's actually the entire idea of this course. I'm giving all perturbative values, then who's gonna do the fantastic numerics that will give us the num perfect numbers of uh, the observables, they, then they can benchmark with, with, with this kind of results. If you think about the particle falling in a Schwarzschild space-time and all the modes are excited, um, Tiomno, Davis, Ruffini, all these kind of very fundamental Zerilli papers, they are perturbative analysis, but they are benchmark for numerical solutions. So it's still all of this, take it as an order of magnitude, but it might be useful because the, the scale inside this problem are very different between the size of the halo and the black hole. So doing numerics with, this, with these guys is very complicated. And that's why we have not many papers on the subjects with numerical methods. So what we do is create a sort of uh, set of, uh, of um, 
toy models that try to capture why, uh, how much energy is falling inside a black hole. So put a, basically a surface of radius R plus at the center of your dark matter halo. Just a surface, it's not a black hole, okay? For now it's not a black hole, it's just a surface. And what you can do is take the psi naught, so the, the background, the background scalar profile of a Newtonian boson star that oscillates with time, it's time dependent, remember that. And you basically express this quantity in a sum of all the, all the, all these, this oscillation. And what happens is that what you are actually doing is uh, looking at an oscillating background and you are forcing some of these frequencies to enter inside the surface and some going out. So what you can, what you can uh, actually uh, try to, to understand is how much scalar field is entering per unit of time inside the surface that is placed at the center of the halo. If you evaluate this quantity by a semi-numerical, so we are solving the equation numerically, but uh, the important part is how it scales this energy that is entering inside the surface the energy per unit of time, uh, how it scales with the mass of the, of the halo, how it scales with the, matter field, uh, the, the mass of the scalar field, and how it depends on the position of this surface. So the idea is that if this surface is a black hole, the energy that enters in cannot actually anymore come out. So in this way, we are modeling the accretion of a Newtonian boson star, time dependent, inside a black hole placed at the center of a galaxy of the halo. And what you can do is show that this energy goes with this power mu to the seven, I think it's mu to the seven, r plus square, mass of the boson star to the fifth. So this quantity by conservation of energy, if you don't have a black hole, is coming in or is coming out. If you have a black hole, it can't come out anymore. Once it's inside, it's inside. So here we use a result by a paper of Unruh in 1976 in which is showing the absorption cross-section of particles, scalar and Dirac ones, by a small black hole. Small black hole. If you take his result, his results are valid for frequency equal to mu, we are taking a kind of limit, the details you can see them in the notes if you are interested, we can talk about it later. But the idea is that we are linking the energy that enters inside a surface that is not a black hole, first part, assuming that the surface is actually a black hole, this energy is linked to the absorption cross-section by black holes thanks to results by Unru that is valid for low frequency wave, low frequency wave. That is always our case because our mass of the scalar field is very small. So this expression that we borrowed, now we can place the value that we evaluate with the toy model of a surface applied for the case of a black hole, and this will tell you that the energy that gets inside is actually absorbed. So how much energy is absorbed is going to go with this power, these powers of the mass of the black hole, of the boson star, and the typical, um, a typical interaction scale between the boson star, that is this mass, the mass of the background times mu, that we heard it many times uh, during this week. Why we are interested in this? because this model is a toy model for accretion. So if you have an order of magnitude estimate of how much energy is absorbed by the black hole, then you can try, you, you, you could say, well, the energy that enters inside the black hole is feeding him. So the, his mass, his mass rate of change is actually going as how, many, how much energy I'm putting in because there is no other way in which the black hole in this case can increase his mass. I'm putting some scalar, he's increasing his mass. And this will tell you, since I'm, I'm computing all time rate of these, uh, of these, of these energy quantities that change, this will tell you the typical time scale that uh, a black hole um, will take to basically double its mass. And we are taking these as an order of magnitude estimate of the lifetime of a boson star. So your, your, your Newtonian boson star is oscillating, is passing inside the black hole, the black hole is absorbing its mass, and the question is, how much time the black hole takes to eat the entire boson star? So as an order of magnitude, we take 
the black hole mass to increase as double its value, I think was that was uh, the number. And this will, will tell you that the typical time scale for this to happen is 10 to the 24 years. So if you were wondering, you have a perturbative system for plunging orbits, well, but your black hole is actually eating the environment. So how good is your perturbation theory that I, I till slide 40, I was claiming that is good. This is also an idea of why this is good, because nothing is really happening. I mean, the black hole takes a lot of time to take the scalar field. So the process is happening, but the eternality of the background, that is one of the hypotheses of doing perturbation theory, is actually quite good. So we are not very far away, it seems like. Please, sure. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it's very interesting. I don't know. So there is a, a fundamental difference between this result and quasi this, this result, by rule, considers that the frequency is bigger than the mass. Because it actually the effect that they search for a, a cross section. So you have a wave that's coming through a black hole. And to have a disk propagation, you have to have the frequency that's bigger than the mass. Well, the cost, the mass. The We, 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 we are our, the tran transmission coefficient, we take the result by continuity. We have to be strictly below mu, but we are taking the limit of the transmission to mu. But we can, we can be as close to mu as we want if we are looking at perturbations that are relativistic. But it's... Well, in, in principle, yeah, probably we have to rethink about this a bit more. But it's, it's in some sense, if you if you if you have mu as your discriminant, by continuity, their results should to go in here. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely. I, be, I should look at the, that paper before having to have a better idea of what is happening, but perhaps in the limit of going to mu, things should be overlapping. And I think the result, uh, at least politically, should, is, is yours. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's very... It's it's but, but yeah. Sure. So uh, this, this surface that we are playing is, uh, placing is small. So this, this, the idea is that this quantity is not dependent on, of course, of who is, who is inside. If you assume that that's not a black hole anymore, but it has some matter that can interact, then this law might completely be different because you might be exciting some of the internal modes of the objects. We're assuming that what gets in, gets in and it's lost by us. So if you would then excite some modes of the neutron stars that is, or there is some kind of reflectivity, then this quantity is not, I cannot take this anymore as an order of magnitude. A sphere and a black hole are more similar, a one-way sphere and a black hole are more similar than a star and a one-way, I would say. It's true, but, 
but this, I, I don't know if the scales there are different, uh, because we have this kind of super small mass scalar field, uh, and everything inside our game is point-like. So this, I mean, of course, this is not point-like anymore. But in general, all this perturbation theory works with point-like particles. So then when you are, when you are, we are saying that the neutron star has a size, then you should look at the metric of this, of this object, and then the things should be a bit different from what I'm doing. Can I just, no. So of course, you're focusing on the planet's here, right? Yes. Right. Yes, it is. So uh, this, this, this final result just tell you that things are very long-lived. So you are, uh, the system is going towards being stable, but it, we know that it's, it cannot be stable. A black hole with a, a static black hole in the scalar field cannot be a stable system. But I mean, it's at least long-lived. And one can uh, further think that the black hole actually is not really static. So in some region of, of the parameter space where you have a scalar field, then you know that some other excitation can, 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 can kick in as super radiance. So you can stabilize even more the system if the black hole is rotating. Because then it, it's, it's true now, coming back to what Kayo was saying, that I should look locally because this is true when the black hole has a metric and not sort of point like, but has an order of idea well, the, the, the thing is almost stable and can be even more stabilized if you add rotation to the system. So this was our treatment. We have uh, two toy models more of a black hole inside the cavity, inside the, the nodes there is more about this, to try to support, of, support this first equation that is the one that is actually giving us the, the, the most important result in here. If that change, things are completely changing here. But there are also numerical solutions that are around by the group of Oxford that are trying to look at this. In, they were doing this in the last two years, I think. So now, let me just take the time, because I don't have it. OK. Fantastic. So now we're going to look at dynamical perturbation of Newtonian boson stars. So now we are putting things moving and, and let things react. OK, let's see what happens in here. And we start with the um, plunging, oscillating, and binaries. It's going to be fast. It's not going to be uh, too long. So first, let me remind you that we are trying to understand, uh, estimate the dynamical friction happening in these events. So when you have a, an object moving or orbiting, it can induce a wake of gravitational particles behind it. In this case, will be some scalar field will kind of wraps up be behind the object moving. And you are trying to understand if this has an effect. This normally, as we already saw during this week, um, modeled by a, a modeling a force, so the, a force due to the wake that depends on the velocity of the object, on the mass, on the environment density. Here, no, we are not doing that. Here we are just looking at the momentum lost by the plunger, the particle that is moving. And we can connect this momentum lost with the energy by, at first order, just doing uh, your relativistic expansion. And then what, what, what you will compute is the force. So we have an idea for the force of the of dynamical friction, assuming that this, this momentum loss is basically constant during the motion. When this happens, so you can, comp you can relate your dynamical friction force with the momentum loss by the particle. This will depend on the velocity, or the initial velocity, for instance, of the, of the particle that plunge. And the key role to find these results inside our framework is the conservation of particles. So the number of particles is conserved. When things interact, there is no particle created. This is due to the U1 charge, U1 symmetry that we had at the beginning that I show you in the equation, in the action. I already motivated last time. Let me just remind you that kicks due to non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non-non
non-perfectly spherical gravitational collapse, as well as super kicks due to uh, black holes that are formed by gravitational, uh, emission, gravitational wave emission, so a binary interacts, collide, form a black hole. This black hole can have some kind of, of initial velocity, and this can actually escape the galaxy. So an astrophysical question that might be interesting is, is the dark matter halo capable to keep these black holes that are moving together? Or, 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 is, or are they actually black holes who should drift away from the, 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 galaxy, the galactic environment? So what we compute for the plunging case is two kind of different motions. We calculate the escaping velocity by a dark matter halo, that is our neutron boson star, and we said, okay, we could have velocity above this quantity or below. If it's above, yeah, your black hole is going away. So we just look at one time of crossing the, uh, uh, the, the black hole cross only once and then it goes away and then we assume that as soon as it escapes, uh, there is no source anymore. So we place to zero the source. Or it's in an oscillatory motion. So the black hole will actually oscillate and every time will interact and eventually we lose some energy by dynamical friction. All the machinery that I showed you in the previous slides can be applied to these cases. You will have to express your energy momentum tensor for the particle that is moving with some initial velocity, and you will be able to numerically compute the energy emitted by this, this, this event, the energy lost by the particle that is moving, and the momentum that if you notice as a minus sign, so I can put everything in the same plot, but the idea is that this is actually a dynamical friction. So you can, if you look at the momentum lost by the perturber, it will be negative. So the particle will slow down, as you expect. But still, a proof, proof of concept of what is happening inside here. Despite the, 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 the typical numbers that are, are also in this scale are not very meaningful, but this scale is universal, as I told you. This quantity all scales with a parameter, so this happened for all the, the perturber with the typical velocity. This will be the energy lost by a perturber with this initial velocity, Vr, for all the Newtonian boson stars. You just have to rescale everything by a quantity. And you can see here that there will be a a certain amount of, of, of energy lost by the, the perturber for velocities we computed between zero and this number that means more or less 6,000 kilometers per second. So these are all astrophysical relevant quantities for if you want to do astrophysics with the, with the center of the Milky Way, for instance. How do you, how do, how do you use this number? So first, you look at E lost you can calculate the momentum lost by the particle and compare it with other results on dynamical friction. And we did it with a paper from 2016 by Hu, your striker, Witten, and Tremaine. And their paper, they have an infinite medium of scalar field. And they are looking at the force lost by a particle that is moving inside this medium. Our result is an order of magnitude smaller. So the idea would be, okay, we are solving actually the same thing. The difference is that their, inf their, their medium is infinite and is uh, non-self-gravitating. So our results show that um, the self-gravity of the scalar field can actually contain a bit your dynamical friction. And that's good to be, to be less than their values because the, um, they are already showing that fuzzy dark matter model can explain why the Fornax cluster of dwarf, uh, the dwarf galaxy that we have around here, uh, the, the dynamical friction is smaller than the, than the time, sorry, the time scale for the dynamical friction is larger, so the force is smaller than the one calculated by WIMPs. So that's exp that explain why this globular cluster of galaxy, they are actually not spiralizing at the center. Our results are similar, an order of magnitude of difference, but not very far away. Uh, but their model is so simple; is way simply simple than ours. Simpler than ours. Still, numerical results are very important in here in order to say and corroborate how things should go. But uh, more than the simple, the, 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 the simple value of the energy lost with respect to the velocity, one thing that might be uh, more interesting 
to compare is the oscillatory motion. And I'm going to see the result in one minute. But the reason is that once a black hole oscillates at the center of a galaxy, if it loses energy by dynamical friction, you can compare this number, so the typical time scale that the black hole will take to stop at the center only because of the dark matter environment, you can compare this assuming that you have the very same galaxy, you have a distribution of stars, and you can see how much time the black hole takes to stop at, to stop at the center only by the dynamical friction induced by the stellar environment. And you can compare the two. So th this is just the model we are using that it's only an oscillatory motion. We, have, we, we can uh, semi-analytically compute the, compute the E dot loss. We solve for this kind of driven harmonic oscillator. But the result that is more important is here. The typical time scale for a black hole to stop at the center of the galaxy because of dynamical friction with dark matter is this number, 10 to the 10 years. How is this number? Is big or small? Well, this number, if you compare it to the typical time scale of stopping because of the stellar environment, is 0 0.1 of it. So the dynamical friction, the dynamical friction that we know for sure is there. The fact that the, the, the stars are interacting with the black hole that is moving is only, the, the time scale is only uh, slightly smaller. So in principle, if you want to look, if you want to do astrophysics with the center of the galaxy, assuming the, the um, dynamical friction by stars, you perhaps should also consider the effect of the halo. And that's an important result because shows that the, our simple model, Newtonian boson stars, might be there, might be not, but if there is a dark matter halo and it works with, with these typical scales of small masses of the scalar field, so you can solve a lot of the small scale uh, problem that cosmology has, well, this very same model shows you that dynamical friction is important to, to know where black hole goes because this can actually slow them down and you, and you can explain why all the black holes are going toward the center and which is the rate for which they are actually going inside the center of the galaxy because of only of dynamical friction reasons. As I told you before, we have a system. We can, we can change the source. So a plunge, particle that is plunging, a particle that is oscillating. This depends on the typical initial velocity. But you can also place a binary. So I hope you can see here. But the idea is that this is an equal mass binary that sorts your perturbation inside the scalar, inside the scalar medium, and you can compute the energy of scalar radiation emitted by, for instance, an emery. Uh, I'm saying an emery because this source, if you change mp, so the mass is an equal mass binary, so the mass of one, if you change this mp by this transformation, you are actually solving for an emery. So you, we have a central black hole and a very small masses that is passing around. So something like Sagittarius A star, S2, and dark matter halo all around. And you can ask, doing this motion, how much energy is emitting in scalar wave? The answer will be, if you use Newtonian boson star, will be this. And the take away, take home message from this plot is the following. Do you remember that quasi normal modes were uh, the, mo the modes of this guy were normal. So nothing could have emitted if it had no frequency larger than gamma. Well, this is gamma. So if your frequencies excited are smaller than gamma, you don't emit anything because far away you don't see anything. The, all this kind of, of excitation stays inside, trapped by the very same scalar medium in which you are, which you are, the, the stars or the black holes are. If you are larger than gamma, but close to this value, the emission is maximized. And probably, uh, if, I don't know if you remember, I, I told you last time, uh, this work has a viscous fluid in which the faster you are, the less you are exciting the scalar. So the closer you are to gamma, the more radiation you are emitted. So something like S2, all these stars that have a typical, um, typical period of some one to 10 years, they emit more 
then Liza, uh, sorry, Liza, Lisa or LIGO binaries that would be on, on frequencies way larger. So the, the closer you are to gamma, the more you are emitting. If you are too far away, so the two stars are too far away, the typical orbits will be smaller than gamma, and then you are not capable to let scalar radiation to escape anymore. This is what happens for binaries. Emrys, or uh, in this case it's for Emry, but you can calculate and just rechange M, and you will find it for equal masses. Actually, for equal masses, uh, if you look at um, perturbation, scalar perturbation, that are um, high frequencies, but still not relativistic, your Schrodinger Poisson system is very easy to handle when you, when you look at it. Here is, there is not, but the idea would be every term can compare one another if you assume something on your frequency. If you're ultra-relativistic, you can cancel most of the term, and actually the Poisson equation decouples from the Schrodinger equation. So it's even easier to solve. Uh, but if you look at high frequency, but still you assume that you're non-relativistic, you can find this analytic solution for the Schrodinger-Poisson Schrodinger -Poisson system. So this is a binary. I don't remember if it's equal mass, but it should be equal mass. No, I think it's an emery, because it's, there is the term there. Uh, this is a binary inside a dark matter halo, and you can actually solve the problem analytically. And we checked this equation, this result, with numerical results that we had, and they actually agree to some extent. Of course, uh, when I'm saying at high but still relativistic, I'm canceling some term in the Schrodinger Poisson system, so then I have to check keeping that terms if things are working, and they actually are. Things go, the fluxes converge exponentially with the, with the index L, and uh, large frequency sources radiate less, the same result that I was showing you before. And also you can compute, since it's an average uh, energy lost by, by the binary, you can compute how much scalar particles are depleted away by the fact that the object is interacting with the medium. So let's place two binary, one, one two particles, one here, one here, one here. There is a scalar around, but the scalar is very big, still far away. And we are assuming that we are, uh, we are computing how much time the binary takes to expel radiation up to 10 lambda. So we take a volume of 10 wavelength of, of the radiation emitted, and we are calculating how much time the binary takes to expel this away, and this time is larger than Hubble time. So once again, our perturbative system is, is well posed. Well, well posed not in, in numerical sense, but you understood what I mean with well posed. It's, it's in place. So omega is way larger than gamma, but it's smaller than mu. One thing that was uh, fun in some sense, uh, for, I mean, for me it was fun, but uh, you, you, can, you can compare how much energy is, is lost by scalar waves with a typical Alsen Taylor loss of orbital period because of the, gra the quadrupole of gravitational waves. And the result is that, looking only at the quadrupole here, the energy lost by scalar particle with respect to the energy lost by gravitational waves is some 10 to the minus five. So it's not for this for S2, so an orbit of 16 years around a Newtonian bottom star of 10 to the nine solar masses and a mass of the scalar field 10 to the minus 22. So it's not very small. Problem is, if you want to maximize this number, you should go to smaller, so to larger periods of, of, of revolution, and this, uh, and this goes to, um, too much towards omega equal, equal mu, and that's a problem. When you have frequency too much close to mu, uh, uh, our Schrodinger Poisson approximation doesn't work anymore. We are for smaller or way larger. And finally, um, we ask the question, the, cis, the binary is emitting gravitational waves. The binary is losing energy in a scalar radiation channel. So if I see, can I see a loss of period, as Alton Taylor, but can I see this, 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 this extra channel of emission in an extra dephasing 
that the gravitational wave will have because the binary is moving inside the medium. So what you should do, what you want to do, is considering that now the energy lost is by scalar particle and gravitational waves, you look at your gravitational wave signal in um, some adiabatic limit, and you say, okay, in the frequency, in the, in the, in the, in the Fourier space, my, my typical metric perturbation can, be, can, can have a phase that has two terms. One term is the usual quadrupole radiation, plus an extra dephasing part due to the fact that now you have E lost, you don't have only E dot in gravitational waves. If you compute this guy, you will have the first result. So the D phase, only due to the emission of scalar particle, is super small. Nothing happens. And this is the reason why we didn't get a PRL. Because we put this number, 10 to the minus 24, the, the paper was amazing, had a lot of things inside. And the answer of the referee was, uh, is only interesting to dark matter and gravitational wave community. I hope the referee is not in this room. But <laughs> it was like, to whom we should, to whom we should be interesting if not dark matter and gravitational wave? It's a wound still open since, since a couple of years, sorry. But this number could have changed completely. And the reason is that we were a bit naive because we look at this, this, this equation and we normalize to be coherent with all the quantities that were already in the paper. So mu 10 to the minus 22, m mu 0 0.01. But these powers, we realized only after, when I was going to defend the thesis, that we could have just <laughs> changed a bit this number, still being in the fuzzy dark matter range, so some mass is 10 to the minus 19, and making the, the halo just a bit, uh, a bit, a bit uh, larger, and have a 10 to the minus 8. And 10 to the minus 8, eventually in 10, 15 years, could be measured. So this result is interesting because it's, it's not super easy, but you can constrain some models if you're not going to see that the orbital loss of period and therefore the gravitational wave emitted by binaries that comes from the center of the galaxy. If this doesn't happen, if you don't measure this dephasing, you can constrain a lot of the model, or at least the mass of the model that you are using to model dark matter halos with scalar fields. And interesting, this contribution is minus 6 pn order, so it's very good for smaller frequencies, but for more, smaller frequencies, this result is not the leading one, because these, LISA, these are LIGO sources. So we should come back again to what I was showing you before of embrace of very, very, very small orbital frequencies. So something like S2. But clearly here we, we are on the, on the LISA band because we wanted to look at LISA sources. This is just a nice, uh, a nice, this is just a snapshot of what is happening. So we have, we have uh, this binary that is, that is rotating, is emitting the quadrupole. This quadrupole is a scalar field. And actually, I think, it's also in, in here. Can I ask you, please, if you can click on this, on this, uh... yeah. So th this is the animation. So th this is what I was showing you now. Binaries will emit scalar field. It depends if you are an emery or an equal bus binary, you will have directly the quadruple. If you have emery, you have also the dipole. But this is what the scalar field will be. We'll just be emitting, so the two black colors at the center of the halo, they are, they are rotating and they're emitting scalar waves with these typical um, time, uh, time scales and energy rate. While on the left side, I'm putting a recap of what I told you about the plunging. You can compute the energies and the momentum lost by particle plunging inside dark matter halos as they were doing for particle falling inside the Schwarzschild spacetime. And you can also com compute in the oscillating case how much time the particles take to stop at the center because of dynamical friction. And this is comparable with what happens by a stellar environment. So these are basically perhaps the, our most important results, but more than our result is what you could do as a starting point, then you can do whatever you want with your creativity. If you want to study objects like a Proca kind of Newtonian boson star, or a Newtonian star, if you want to study if you want to add uh, a nonlinear potential to your 
to your dynamics because here we are in the minimal case in which the potential is mu square phi square, but you can complicate the game with other potentials. You can look at other kind of fields, Procas, for instance, and you can change the eccentricity because we are looking mostly at circular orbits, but you can complicate even the game of the particles that are moving inside. And these are some of the things that you could try to answer in your new model. Eventually, uh, I'm arriving to the end. These are some of the references. I couldn't put them all because they are a lot. There are a lot. So if you are interested, I can give you my notes. And there, there are the references. The first one is my PhD thesis. I put it because it took me some time to <laughs> write everything down. So inside there, there are probably 350 references. So also inside here, there are all the others. Uh, the, the papers in which it was based, most of these, this final part of the, these two lectures. A very nice paper by the organi very same organizers of this group in which they already look at binaries moving inside this kind of dark matter uh, environments, scalar environments at least. Why environmental effects are, are important? Which environmental effects are important? So I show you once the dynamical, the, sorry, the, the the, emission, the, the, the phasing in a gravitational wave because of a scalar matter, but there are other environments, that, uh, environmental effects that might be important. This is the paper that gave uh, uh, to most of us a lot of new credibility in 2016 <laughs> because it came this, out this paper as scalar field as cosmological viable dark matter uh, candidate, and everyone is like, okay, now I can motivate more my scalar field. So thanks to these guys. Uh, these guys, I mean, you can read the names. And then this is very nice. If you want to have um, an idea of all this historical part of dark matter that I talked in the first lecture, I would say that this, this first and the second paper are a very good read. And inside, you will have a lot of referencing to papers in German, in Italian, in Spanish, in every language, because they are really going to the sources 200 years ago. And finally, the first paper that, that I took when I started to model boson stars and oscillatons, because they have the solution. So we use this paper to, have to, to look at the background. And then on top of this background, we built our post-Newtonian expansion or perturbation. But all these are very good reads, and I hope to that I know this was the la this is the spectrograph by Ford and Rubin. I put it here just as a as a referencing on how we know the dark matter is there. Well, we know it also thanks to this to this uh, small device. And this, I wanted to close with this uh, with this slide. This is the very same church that I showed you at the beginning, but this is for me is even more spectacular because after that first thing you have this dome. Do you see something weird in this dome? This is from the, inter the interior. Well, this is fake. This is flat. This is completely painted. This is not real. This is not a real dome. It's just completely flat. But the guy was a master of perspective. And I hope that I put in perspective the very same problem of dark matter. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. So this is not a dome. <laughs> it's not a dome. <laughs> you know, so, uh, this is not a pipe, you know, the famous, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo, for the enthusiastic and very uh, informative lecture. We have time for questions, uh, about 10 minutes, so feel free to ask more um, if you'd like, or uh, if you're tired, we can just end and then discuss afterwards. Is there any question online? Is there any question in the room? Is there anyone that will? Okay, of course. Okay. So, uh, uh, so you related the the change in the internal energy or in the, the mass of the star by the you know by the radiation that it releases, right? So, but uh, also 
I was thinking that the moving uh, bodies inside the, the structure, even if it doesn't radiate, it truly will change something. So I, ex I expect, so I understand the, the, the reason why you relate dynamical friction with the radiation and the flux of momentum. But I, I was thinking that even if you don't have radiation, you should have dynamical friction at, of some sort, right? It's like you are moving inside a fluid. So a scalar, a scalar field can be modeled as an effective uh, anisotropic fluid. So uh, how do you uh, reconcile these two things? So uh, thank you for the question. It's very complicated, as you can imagine. Uh, the, we had for some period, once we look at the, the modes excited were normal, we were like, OK, far away, no one happened, nothing happens. But inside, something happens. So we had an entire section that now I don't remember anymore why we removed it. So it's there, it's commented out by the paper. But we had some, of the, some grasp of what was happening uh, inside. And the, uh, the idea was precisely that. When you, when you move, you excite. And if you, if, I mean, in this case, we were looking at normal modes. So there's nothing moving. It's the object. But in principle, you can imagine as an object move, excite the quasi-normal modes. Well, if an object move, we'll excite the normal modes. So an observer inside will see something and then could say something about the motion of the object. The problem is that we are not looking at any back reaction on the word line of the, of, of the perturber. So I, the only way to relate the P loss lost by it's, it's with radiated quantities. Because, so in this case, would be an observer placed inside. Because if you don't do that, how can you know the object, how it's moving, if you don't include back reaction? You need a time evolution, and we don't have that. We have everything in the Fourier space. So that's why we then, I think, we commented out the problem. Yeah, and also the thing that you, so the way that you compute, for instance, for circular orbits, you are doing the average procedure, right? You, you assume that it stays, it stays, it stays there eternal, without, eternal. It, without changing everything, anything for a very for a long time enough, such that yes. you can uh, consider this. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, so for dynamical friction. The usual computation with fluid dynamics, uh, it, there is no such assumption. But you, what you do is you com you compute how the density changes, right? So in your case, it should be you compute how the matter uh, adjusts itself around the star. And after that, you integrate with the Newton's equations of uh, I, gravity. I, I agree with you. I might say that if the orbit that you are interested is S2, the, the, well, the way you can never interact with your own wake, at least, something like this. So yeah, it's yeah. true that, it's, that it can have an effect, but I can imagine that the effect of readjusting the matter is m more important once the motion is mm. high frequencies. But we don't have that kind of calculation in here. Mm -hmm. We are only looking, relating what's happening at infinity to what happens inside. But you are right. totally right. That and also, if you have fun. just one perturbate, you maybe would also transmit angular momentum to the structure itself, right? So if you put something, so in the case of extreme mass fashion spiral, if you put, e even if you place like a perturbate in circular orbit inside the star, I can imagine that after some time. Uh, so just because you are moving but, around but, matter. But that we have in principle, because we have that the energy, the, the angular momentum okay. lost uh, is delta L that it, is the equivalent of the tidal heating, but on the angular side. So that we have, we can relate del delta L with the L of the particles emitted and then compute it only with radiated quantities. It's not only what happens in far away, it's what happened far away plus a first order approximation of what happens inside. Thank you, Caio. Thank you, Lorenzo. So we are five minutes behind schedule, although we started a bit later, so I think we should conclude now. Thanking Lorenzo again for the nice set of lectures. Thank you.